Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jacob and today I'm going to be talking with Wayne D. Kramer, who is my boss, the author of the Heroes of Time series, as well as Ed Romanoff, who is the narrator for the single narrator audiobooks. Yes, I said audiobooks, plural. So, Murdoch's Choice, as well as, very soon, Murdoch's Shadow. We're getting ready to start on the production of the Murdoch's Shadow audiobook, and we thought this would be a good time to take a minute, pause, reflect, and just kind of talk over the creative process. Wayne and Ed are going to be talking with each other, and I just have a few questions set aside just to get their conversation started. It's going to be a lot of fun, so join us for this. So let's go ahead and start with Ed. Uh, with how do you uh, prepare for narrating a fantasy story like this, and do you have a specific routine or method that you use? The best way to start any story is to talk with the author and find out what the heck the story's about. The, the best way to understand how to, how to begin is to meet with the author, find out what, what they're actually looking for in this particular story, and make sure that their needs and, and their vision is met as closely as possible. So uh, when I told is you that, this was a is that too short an answer? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Ed, uh, when I told you this was about a sixty-year-old kooky uh, uh, sailor and his feisty red panda companion, that is all you needed to know, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I love the fact that you based it on a real person, and you gave me a lot of background about Skip and. Real people are are sometimes easier to uh, to emulate, uh, especially if it's someone that you know well. At the same time, I never met the man, but you gave me enough background on Skip that it was it was uh, it was a voice that I was able to find, and clearly you you felt that my voice was something that uh, would fit his personality. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and a little background on that, too, since uh, this the captain uh, of our story and the main character of our story, Captain Zale Murdoch, um, is based on a real person in my life. Um, wasn't something that I originally set out to do. This wasn't going to be the crux of the Heroes of Time series, right? I wasn't originally going to um, start everything off with Captain Murdoch and, uh, and, and his own adventure but it developed into that. Um, what I have in the Heroes of Time series is, you know, the Murdoch series is actually a tie-in to the main series, what will be the main series later on, kind of like your Iron Man or Captain America to your Avengers. And uh, Captain Murdoch was just going to be another character in the main series. And um, back when Skip was still alive, in that last year of his life, even the last few months of his life, uh, there was there was this one time we were in the car, we were just having conversation. I think we we're actually on our way to a work trip together because we worked together. Um, and Skip, um, he was this larger than life individual that was, he had these funny voices. He had like almost two personalities. He had this really gruff, serious side. And then he had this fun loving pop pop side that was just just hilarious to family and friends alike. And uh, and I was like, you know, man, I want to make a character off of you. I don't normally do that. Like, I don't normally directly base a character off of a real person, but I think that we should make a character out of you in the series that I've that I am developing. And I'm like, what would you like to be? And he told me, um, without a whole lot of thought, honestly, he's like, I want to be a seafaring merchant specializing in high value cargoes for the kingdom. <laughs> Well, oh, that sounds interesting. That was oddly <laughs> specific. I know, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Like, you already thought about this, haven't you? Um, he had been in the Navy. Maybe that had something to do with his uh, with his thought process. But mm. um, yeah, no, Skip was such an interesting guy. And uh, you know, there were times in his life when he when he drove me and other people absolutely crazy. Uh, 
but uh, especially later on, he was such a great guy and, and such a good um, kind of a step grandfather to my to my kids. Uh, he was kind of part, he was part of our family. He had married into our family, married my my uh, mother in law. And uh, but even before that, he actually we actually worked together in the same in the same business. He worked for we both worked for my father's company and medical equipment. So we had a lot of close ties and we would travel the world together and do lots of things together and, and saw each other at family events and work events. And so we were very close. And um, and yeah, Ed, um, when we were doing our auditions for several we, we we went through probably a dozen maybe a dozen different narrators and um i just remember listening to each one and just thinking okay is this somebody that could pull it off can this pull off what i know skip is like and um you hit it you hit it and i, and I just i just remember thinking yeah this is the voice that's going to work um and and I think it was even the edition even included uh, part one of our little sea shanties from from the book. <laughs> now, did I don't remember? Did you give me that melody, or is that something I came up with? Nope, nope. We just gave you guys the song, and you guys kind of just came up with whatever melody uh, seemed to fit. Okay, I, I love when you say you guys because that's all of the forty-two voices I think that I put into Murdoch's choice. <laughs> That was um, amazing. How do how do you approach creating distinct voices for for such a wide range of characters? Jacob, I I grew up on cartoons. <laughs> I, I I don't know how else to 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 start this. I well, I grew up on television, and uh, years ago I used to have on my resume that uh, Mel Blanc was my acting teacher. And it was a good starting point, you know, when I would walk into an audition. And finally, somebody said, really? Mel Blanc was your acting teacher? I said, no, he, he just never knew it, you know? So all of these voices and characters that I grew up with in the 112 years that I've been on this earth, um, <laughs> that I have this catalog of, of people from, from cartoons, and television shows and uh, movies that I've watched my whole life. And if I, while I'm reading, for example, if I'm, if I'm reading the chapter and there you have, you have a character, Vidimir, we were talking about him before we began this taping. Uh, Vidimir just has this, has this, uh, a sleazy, oozy greasiness to him of of a of a villain, and somehow, somehow, I just heard this this kind of very celibate kind of villainous kind of person fall out of my face, <laughs> <laughs> and it it's one of those things. Uh, you know, I've been an actor since I was. 17 years old and doing a lot of plays and a lot of musicals you get to watch people you get to create characters and sometimes it just comes out of the material and this book your book series wayne uh you have so many characters and i can say that because i'm all of them uh in in at least one version of murdoch's choice and i love the fact that you came back to me <clears throat> excuse me, you came back to me a couple of times and said, can we get like five or six more guys talking here? And it's like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that they're all sailors on a sailboat as pirate types, that opens the door to a lot of sounds and a lot of different people from different parts of the world. Yes. Yes. And, and I loved what you did with, with a lot of the voices. And, and honestly, you know, we gave you some liberty on that. And, and there were, a there was a time or two, I'm like, is that what we're going with? Is that what we're going with? But, uh, you know, it's like, he, he, he sounds uh, lispy. And, um, but you know, in the end, I warmed up to it a lot. And uh, even though it wasn't the character that I originally imagined. Are you talking about Vidimir now? I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, beep. 
um, <laughs> Casper <laughs> Gibbers. Beep. Yeah, Beep Gibbers. Um, yeah, uh, you, you had such a unique voice come out for him that was completely not what I thought. What oh, I yeah, yeah, yeah. A deckhand is not an officer. Oh, yeah. 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 That's that. Uh, for some reason, I thought this guy might not have all, all of his teeth. <laughs> Seriously. So, I'm sure most of them don't. Yeah, probably most yeah, of them. But, but this, the lateral lisp that, 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 that kind of came out is the way he does kind of squirts. Squirt, <laughs> squirt. Just done. imagining him, you know? him like spewing spittle all over you as he's, he's talking. Just a, yes. He's just a spitter. <laughs> yeah, I know. And by the end, I'm like, you know what? Yes, that's that's just great. I would have never even thought of that. You know, so, like I said, yeah, like I said, it it comes out it comes out of the need to to make all of the character all of these people individuals. You know, even the yeah. women. That's actually one of the questions that uh, I wanted to bring up that, you know, how do you do women? And it's like, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Part of, part of the thing. It's, it's so funny. Uh, the narrator, Scott Brick, uh, some of your listeners may know who Scott Brick is. He's a, he's a very talented actor and narrator. Uh, he and I both agree that women, th their voice can be a little more aspirated and it goes up at the end. You what I always say is that the women just have to sound smarter than the men, which isn't too hard in most most cases. Right. So, and the men and the men are just always determined to be right. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah. Wayne, I I vaguely remember this process, um, but for for the benefit of uh, the the viewers. Uh, how did you decide on Ed being the narrator for Murdoch's Choice, and what was that process like? What made Ed kind of the standout? Oh, I want to hear this. <laughs> um, well, so we had the uh, the audition in the original process. We auditioned, you know, I, I think again about a dozen or so different narrators um, that the studio I was working with had had rounded up, and. Um, <laughs> We had everybody do the one scene with the sea shanty, um, including the sea shanty and including various uh, the the subsequent part where where Murdoch is is just cutting up and laughing and being um, and being his kooky self, his more goofy self. Um, I was listening for things like who's getting the laugh right, who's getting that good guttural laugh that I know would embody Skip. Um, and, uh, Ed's was, was just a good range. It was a good range of, you know, the narration sounded smooth and was easy to listen to. Cause I mean, I've, I personally don't listen to a lot of audiobooks. It's not how I mostly consume reading material. Um, but some that I've heard, you get a narrator that you don't like to listen to. And I mean, we all know, we all know there's that one book that was like, oh, I couldn't do it. Um, where the voice just didn't work. I wanted it to be a good, smooth, easy to listen to voice. And Ed, Ed checked that box. And I wanted it to have that good whimsical side that I knew Murdoch would burst out having at different moments. And Ed checked that box. Um, and then there was the song, the song. And, and Ed checked that box because that was a lot of fun. But Ed did something extra too that nobody else did. And that was putting in the extra voices, the background vocals um, with the music. Most of the crew joined in at the end of each verse, frothy drinks splashing from their upraised mugs. We're kings of the sea, yeah, we bring the loot. To all other sea dogs, we give the loot. Our captain's name is Sail the Gale. Hey ho, lift up your ale. And I'm like, wow, if you're going to be able to, to put that kind of attention into the whole thing, then, then I'm in. This is, you know, the voice matches and, and, uh, and that sounded great. So that was kind of, that was it for me, really, uh, through that audition process. Just, uh, it was just so, it was just so fun to listen to. I forgot how ambitious I really was during that audition process. <laughs> Yeah, yeah you, the crowd voices, noticed. yeah. Oh, right. 
Yeah. Yeah. And in that, fact, and, I even think uh, I think maybe the very first time after after we were actually recording, the very first time you recorded that scene again, I think you left out some of that. And I'm like, wait a minute, go back to the way you did the audition. <laughs> where's, where's the rest of the band? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that and as we went on, when and when all of the the crew were on the ships, uh, or, or yeah, ship, I guess the ship, uh, it was it was a lot of fun to add, you know, uh, a half a dozen or so extra voices with the cheering, or or just singing singing off pitch or just behind the beat or just ahead of the beat because you know these the this isn't a choir these are all you know sailors on a ship just kind of drinking and clanking and, and singing songs and it was a lot of fun to do yeah yeah the... and, and i think that's it i think i think that it showed right it showed that you were having a good time doing it yeah um and and also to feel like you know, uh, to, to work with a narrator that I felt I could, I could give, obviously we have to give specific direction on a number of things, but to feel like that we can give some creative license um, to the part of this that obviously you are more of an expert about, which is the performance side um, and just the audio side in general, um, that's big for me too, because because then we can really, you know, when you've, when you've got those creative juices going into it and everybody's having a good time with it, I just feel like that really shows in the final product. Well, I truly appreciate the collaborative part that that you that you keep in this, Wayne. Because for what you just said, uh, you have come to me to to bring life to these characters, and uh, I try to honor what what you're looking for. And there there were several times where I've recorded something, and you said that's not quite where he's supposed to go, or um, I think they're a little older or I think they're a little younger. This one needs to be a little smarter. And I didn't think he was going to be that stupid when you, when, when I wrote him, you know, it was that those were the kind of notes that I liked getting from you. And then I will, uh, what I will do for him, Jacob is, is go back and record uh, a short passage and, and then with a note saying, is this more like it? And nine times out of 10, it's like, yep, that's the one. So, I try to uh, I try to hang on to that, and I save that in a uh, in a special file, audio file, and I label it so I know what to, to go back to. Nice, uh, Wayne. What was it like for you to hear Ed bring Captain Murdoch to life, knowing he was based on Skip? Um, yeah, it was surreal. I mean, it was it was it was fantastic, um, <laughs> and it was always just you know it, it's one of those things where or in the process of producing this. And every time that I would get a new file from Ed, it was like, Ooh, I just can't wait to listen to this. You know, I knew I was, I was, you know, obviously I was reviewing everything and screening it all, but at the same time I was just, there was always this sense of excitement. Like um, I just knew I was going to enjoy what, what I was going to hear. And that was always the case. Um, hearing the voice come to life. Uh, uh it's a very it's very meaningful because you know again skip is no longer with us and um and um hearing him come to life through ed's voice because ed really does a very good job better than than unfortunately you guys will ever know um is uh it brings new life to a character that just has meaning for me and uh and others that i know um, that's just a very deep meaning. And so it, it's, I love it. I love it. It's, it, it means a lot to hear it come to life and, uh, and to hear Ed do it so well. Um, everything from the, uh, the way that he talks to his grandkids to, to the way that he laughs, you know, that, oh, you know, kind of thing that he can do, um, is perfect. The it's audio perfect. cut out. So just I, I always, I always love it. The audio cut out just a little bit. Do that laugh for me again. Oh, well, Ed probably should do the laugh, but uh, yeah, that ah, kind of laugh. Ah, okay. it, ah, it, ah, it, ah, it's yeah. it's a it's a big yeah, it is a big man belly laugh, which yeah. I can probably <laughs> 
Nice. Yes. Is that it? And can I just can I just say it, it's very close. <laughs> it's very close to uh, to the voice that I used when I was the voice of the plant uh, for a production of Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> oh, wow! If if you've ever listened to the original recordings, uh, I mean it, it's a very scary, deep, guttural laugh. But when when the <laughs> when the plant says. Feed me, <laughs> you know. That's that's scary. So i nice. i want to I want to make it more a little more jovial. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, no, it, it works. It works. It works, and I love it. And uh, I think I think other people have really loved it too. Uh, has Murdoch evolved from your initial conception of him to the character that he is now? Has he evolved? I mean, it's it's hard to say. I, you know, I think all characters through the course of their journey should evolve some, right? Everybody should grow. Um, I think that story-wise, within Murdoch's choice, he grows the most in the relationship with his daughter, Starlina. And that's um, so yes, there's definitely there's definitely some growth and evolution there. I mean, uh, as has... he kind of realizes. I mean, has uh, the that? character gone in directions that you didn't expect? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, I don't think so. I, I think for the most part, uh, he, um, I think he, I think he's he does pretty much what I would expect that captain to do. Um, he, you know, the, the, the adventurous guy. He's a uh, your treasure hunting kind of guy, seafaring merchant, merchant going after that hard to find stuff. And um, yeah, he just goes in there and does what it takes. Um, and he's, and he's often got an attitude about it. You know, he, um, when the sea dread captures him on the ship, he doesn't forget to call him a rat bag. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's through and through Captain Murdoch. All right. Ed, uh, what characters have you had the most fun voicing? And is there a character you feel particularly connected with or, or found resonating with your own experiences? I, th I think the character that I've, I've had the most fun with throughout the entire book was Sea Dread because, because he, he embodies everything everything about a, a, a bad nasty pirate that that I envision in all of all of my uh, pirate world <laughs> that I've ever that I've ever experienced his he he's he's everything from from Blackbeard uh, to you know Johnny Depp you know all of those things rolled into one and he's and he's devious. So it's also one of the, the most fun voices to do. Because, because he's 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 just one of those guys. He's just he's just someone that you can you can just really lean into and say things like, I'll just cut you throat. <laughs> and and I and I do, I literally lean into it like I just did. But uh He's a lot of fun. Wiggle Belly was a lot of fun because he's just a uh, yeah. big, big, fat, silly guy. You know, he's he's the cook. And, you know, doesn't want to fight. He, he would rather hide under the stove. You know, he's um, and oh, yeah. he we yeah, you 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 I think you wanted him to be you know, to be high pitched. I think that that's what you asked for, Wayne, originally. So he's yeah yeah he he's way up here and you know and and it's like, and he's got that ridiculous giggle uh, that only somebody <laughs> named Wiggle Belly would have <laughs> you know and it's it's <laughs> it's almost you know it's almost Popeye but it's not it's not quite um, who else did I have fun with. Um, a Vidimir, like I said before, because he's just, he's just stinky. Uh, he's, I, I, I love what, how you've written him and he's, uh, he's some, you just can't trust him. 
you can't trust him that, and yet he has all the power. So that's, that's why, that's why he's, he's so much fun, so much fun to do. And you'll get to if see him even were more to... in Murdoch's shadow. I yeah. know. I, I love that. I was reading, I was reading the prologue and it's like, Oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> You're going to oh, love yeah. this. Is, this is, you're going to love what you get to do with Secret in Murdoch's Shadow, too. I, yeah. I'm Seedred's so looking forward to doing this. Yeah, yeah. Well, before that's, you... That's get great. Me. Yeah, it's like, yeah, don't... Go ahead. Uh, okay. I was going to say, before you go and name <laughs> off the entire voice cast, uh, what character was the most challenging <laughs> for you? Um, let's see. Well, or were there any particular as, scenes as, or, or chapters that were more challenging to narrate? Well, well, the multiple character chapters are always challenging because, uh, uh, as you've seen in the, in the master tracks that I sent you, I would have as many as 12 to 15 tracks stacked up on top of each other order for everything from the multiple voices talking to each other to the sound effects happening all at the same time. So the the more involved chapters with the more people and the more action time consuming, the the ability to read you have to read each line and leave enough space so that you can shift your brain and shift your voice to the other character. I believe there's a there's a scene in Murdoch's Choice where it is it's Starlina and Jensen and Murdoch and Seedred. I mean they all kind of show up at one time or another. Am I am I correct there, Wayne? There is, yeah, there is in the cave yeah. scene. Right. And all of those all of those lines have to be taken separately. And in order to make it sound like natural conversation, no matter what the um, what the energy is or what the, the the dynamics of the drama, I then have to go back and and mesh them all together uh, and sew it sew it all together so that it overlaps correctly. Uh, but each each individual character has to be recorded. I record it in order to make sure that the that the scene sounds right but then it's 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 putting it all together to make it sound natural oh wow okay yeah okay so yeah so you've got multiple you wonder why this takes so long <laughs> yeah well that's interesting all right so you've got multiple characters talking to each other working through the scene you're actually are you are do you read through the whole thing and then just switch up your voice? Or are you actually recording every voice separately and then stitching it back together? I switch back and forth between the characters. So what I will do, the easiest thing to do is while I'm recording is I will read, for example, I'll read Jensen. And then I will pause and make sure I know what I'm going to say next to respond to what Jensen just said. And then I'll read Starlina's line. And then if Murdoch jumps in, I need to make sure I know what he's saying in reference to what they just said. And there may be a small space. It doesn't make any difference, but I just make sure that the continuity is what your reader would read if they had the book in their hands, or as mm -hmm. the listener will hear with the continuity and the natural dramatic pr uh, progression of the scene. So you don't okay. necessarily just hold the script up and just read it straight through from voice to narration to voice to narration, and you don't necessarily just go straight through like that. Oh, I do. I do, but I will pause between each section to make mm -hmm. sure that all of it matches what's coming up and what just happened. And then I stitch okay. it all together. Awesome. And, it works. And it's and it's time and you know it's time consuming, but that's that's what that's what editors do. Yeah. They do they do it with film. They do it and this is what we do with audiobooks. Yep. Right, right. 
So Wayne. So how um, does one decide that they're going to become a? How, how does one decide that they're good at uh, audiobook narrating? You're just gonna wake up one day <laughs> and hear yourself speak and like, I've got this wonderful sultry voice. I'm going to read books for a living. <laughs> that's that's the answer. Next question, please. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, when let's see, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, when I decided to do audiobooks, um, I had uh, I had decided to relaunch uh, my voiceover work. I had done voiceover work uh, back in the the seventies and eighties, uh, you know, local commercials and stuff like that. Uh, I got started in radio when I was eighteen, so I knew I had a a, a voice that was that was pleasant. And uh, like I said, grew up on on characters and watching television, so I I knew I I could come up with voices, and I I loved telling jokes. So when when the time came when I wanted to relaunch my my voiceover career, uh, I went to a site that is going to stay nameless because I don't want to talk about them, uh, but I went to a site that hired me <clears throat> to uh, to do my my first audiobook and that first audiobook won me the Benjamin Franklin Gold Award for, from the Independent Book Publishers of America for the best nonfiction audiobook of 2021 and I thought to myself maybe I should do this <laughs> yeah so maybe that it was works. when I stuck yeah. I, that was when I started pursuing more audiobooks, and I discovered ACX, uh, which is where I found you, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did I, did How, I find however, you? I don't know how you found me. Um, however, you got um, drawn into that first audition process. Yeah, it was a. Uh, the, I I don't remember. I I want to say that I met you through ACX, which is the company that produces most of Audible's uh, audiobooks. Right. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't ACX. I remember now. It was a, it was a third party independent company um, that I had been working with uh, previous. I had, done a, I had done an audiobook with them. Uh, it was another, uh, it was another nonfiction uh, heroic kind of character and uh they sent me you had contacted them and then they sent me the uh the material and that was how i met you okay yeah and we have yeah. and 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 here we are on the sequel yeah finally yes finally finally, finally yeah. it took us a while yes. to get yeah. to it yeah, that was it was two all of that happened in 2021. Yeah. And yeah, part of dead, yes. And I was fortunate because with COVID and the world shutting down and not being able to perform live anywhere, um, I was able to do uh several audiobooks during the lockdown. Yeah. So Good. yeah. Yeah, that, that worked out well for you. It sure did. It sure did. Yeah. All right. So Wayne, um, other than Skip, were there any other real life inspirations for characters or events in the series? Um, character wise, um, yeah, I mean, I, there there honestly was in this in in this particular story. Um, I decided to go ahead and run with. I, I I decided to make the crew based on people that Skip knew that Skip was close to in life. Um, some of them are pretty close to the real people, um, friends and, and co-worker, past co-workers. And um, some of them are almost like a mix of a couple of different people that I knew and just kind of, you know, use the general mannerisms or look um, as an inspiration. And um, so, yeah, there, there are a few. Um, you know, one is a friend of mine, uh, the character Fump. Uh, He's he's based off a real guy, and the character's pretty close um, to to the way he and, is in real life. And the um, the real guy, I believe, Skip actually did nickname him Fump. Yes, he did. He did. Yeah, Fump was was a real nickname uh, that he had um, 
we were all coworkers. We all worked for my parents' company. And um, so Skip had given him the name, the nickname Thump. Um, Yvette is somebody that is um, a work colleague um, that Skip also knew. Um, so I had based, um, uh, you know, not, 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 a, not any specific thing about her mannerisms, really. Um, her mannerisms are actually kind of a mix of the real person and probably like Amorosa from Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, that kind of thing. Now, did, um, sh did Skip call Yvette Shrew? Um, no, no, that was so. not, that was not a Skip nickname, actually. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I don't think he had a nickname for her. What did I call Emma? Is it Anna Marie? Anna Marie's the, the character in Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Um, I think uh, so. the, the one played by Zoe Saldana. Yeah. Um, and I think you know the 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 others, you know, Beep, Wigglebelly. Um, those are those are kind of hodgepodge characters based off of, uh, based loosely off of real people, um, but kind of a mixed character trait of of multiple people you know so um so yeah there's a lot of inspiration there that i just ran with because i kind of felt like if i'm gonna put skip in the book then i might as well kind of make his his crew of murdoch's mates uh the kind of people i know he'd hang out with so i went with the real life inspirations for a lot of that so you've been writing fantasy for ever <laughs> basically and uh, what has been, like, some of the most challenging aspects of specifically writing a seafaring fantasy adventure? Um, probably the fact that I'm not anything close to a sailor myself. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> in fact, if I go out on, like, a fishing boat and on the ocean, I get seasick with, I mean, about the time the boat stops, within about five minutes, I have horrible seasickness. So I'm like probably about the worst um, as far as any kind of sailing uh, prowess. And I had to research a lot. I, I had to jump into world building groups. I had to correspond with various experts. Um, I had another author, uh, Chris Jackson, who had written a series called Blood Sea Tales. Um, I met him at another conference and, uh, and, and corresponded with him to help me make sure that things were accurate um, and, and to help me with, you know, some additional um, terms and, and, and just some of the various things that people would actually do in caretaking a ship like that and living on a ship like that. And um, getting all that together, I mean, it's, that's a little bit harder as a writer if you're not really an expert on the thing you're writing about because it, it kind of holds you up. It keeps, it holds you from going just smoothly forward with the, with the, um, with the story like you normally would. Um, I, I have to stop and think about, okay, what would they be doing right now? You know, on this, on the ship. Um, and, uh, and so that is probably one of the more challenging aspects of writing a seafaring tale for me. And um, in the end, I was really, really pleased with, with, with what we came up with. Uh, with what I came up with from all the things that I had pulled together, but it did make it challenging in some various unique ways. So, um, yeah, that's probably, that's probably the biggest thing. Like if you, when you specifically mentioned seafaring, um, I would not want to be on the boat myself because I'd probably be one of those guys hanging over the rail half the time. All righty. So Ed, uh, we talked about, you said you've just recently read the prologue of Murdoch's Shadow. Uh, as we are recording this, you have not read the main book. Uh, no, I so have not. What do you think may happen in this in this adventure? Any theories? I don't know, and I can't wait to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, what what I enjoy most about <clears throat> excuse me, what I enjoy most about new books or any kind of audio book that I, that I read after I've talked with the author and in this case with Wayne to find out what the story, what the storyline will be. I love being the audience. I love being the reader for the first time. There have been many times where I get surprised just like 
you would reading any story or hearing, you know, watching a film or watching a television show or hearing an audiobook where you just go, what? Are you kidding me? And I love it because I keep that emotion, the immediacy of the emotion while I'm reading. And I, I don't necessarily read everything cold, but I do hang on to what I just read in the chapter to know what's coming and to plan it that way. So when you ask me, what do I think it's going to be about? I have no idea. And I can't wait to go chapter by chapter to find out. Nice. It is an epic adventure for sure. <laughs> well, it's 25 uh, chapters. That's a little epic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's got some heft. Yeah. No, the, yeah, that's, it's, I, it's, uh, it's an epic one for sure. But, but, they're uh, chapter, but they're not that long. The chapters aren't that long. So but you can see, I've got the two here. You can see, so here we have choice on top and shadow <laughs> on the bottom. So you can see the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not quite twice, but it's uh, just it's about. very, very close to it's very yeah. close to double. Yeah. Yeah. So Wayne. Wayne, without giving too much away. Uh, OK, so yeah. obviously Shadow la, 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 has la, 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 has been la, 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 out for a while. Um, and so most of the people watching this will have uh, at least had the opportunity to have read Shadow. So. For those who have not, uh, without giving too much away, can you hint at what readers and listeners can expect in Murdoch's Shadow? And for those who have read everything so far, can you give any sort of hint, again, without giving too much away, at what's coming in Murdoch 3? So for what's coming next in Shadow, choices have con consequences. And... You know, we, we for those who have read Murdoch's choice, we know Murdoch was faced with a very difficult choice at the end of the book. Um, and he made that choice and it was a uh, it was a choice that he cannot take back. Um, and he's going to be faced with the immediate aftermath of that and what it means. Um, and uh, he's going to be coming face to face with with the shadow and the darkness of the void. And uh, and dealing with all of those who may not particularly appreciate the choice that he made in in uh, the first book, um, and then in the, and then the third Murdoch. Well, you know, expect a, an epic and satisfying conclusion to the very many arcs that are go that are coming around. It, it's it's hard to say a whole lot without giving away things that happen in Shadow. Yeah. Um, but, but at the end of shadow leaves us with a lot of things, uh, to wrap up. And, and so Murdoch three will be, will be wrapping those things up and, and bringing us around to what I hope will be a very adventurous and exciting, um, epic quest, um, with Starlina stepping up to the plate quite a lot and, um, and Zale, uh, Zale in a, in an interesting predicament. I'll say that much. <laughs> All right. Ed, do you I, do? I'm, I'm sitting here like a, Sorry. I'm watching a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. as I've already said, I've only read the first book. And, and I read each chapter as a new reader. So I'm excited to get rolling. Can we go now? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> get cracking. Yeah. Ed, do you do anything in particular to keep your voice in good shape? I I try to do uh, vocal exercises uh, as a as a singer, and I've been a professional singer for many many years. Uh, there were warm ups, simple warm ups you do in the morning. Uh, one of the things I do as a narrator, uh, depending on the characters uh, in the particular voice that I'm going to be doing. Uh, the morning will depend on whether or not I drink coffee. Because if I need to be sea dread, or if I need to be somebody who has a very deep guttural kind of sound, it's not as easy to get to that gurgle, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, if, if the, uh, the caffeine has, uh, has dried out your vocal cords. So... Sometimes mm. the struggle is focusing on the text 
<laughs> without a cup of coffee at nine, nine or nine thirty in the morning when I start recording. Uh, I won't record earlier than that because I can't even make it, you know, to the the book. But it, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, it it is it. I try to take care of myself. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't drink. Uh, well, I certainly don't drink like I used to because I'm still drunk from the '80s. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I try. Uh, I, I, alcohol never happens. I can always pretend to sound like that, and uh, all of all of the uh, all of the work that I do, all of all of the narratives that I do. Uh, if I tend to get, if I get tired, if I can feel my voice getting tired, I, I, I will stop because suddenly my narrative voice will start getting more hoarse and it's all about continuity at that point. So I'm imagining, you know, getting up in the morning, getting ready for a nice big recording and looking at the cast list of the day. I'm like, all right, some characters are going to be water. Some are going to be a nice warm tea. And this one, I'm just guzzling a whole tanker to the ale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can I can certainly pretend that. And actually, I discovered one. I, I can't remember what the what the occasion was, but I discovered after having a a handful of cookies and a big glass of milk, there was a voice that came out really well because my voice my throat was covered in in lactic liquids and and uh -huh. uh, I. Uh, I, I won't go into any more than that. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for both of you, if you were on the Queenie, what would you hope that your role or job would be? Oh. Well, see, we've already heard that Wayne would be hanging over the gunnels. <laughs> I know, so. right? I, it's like, I'm just trying not to be sick. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'll probably be in the hammocks. You, uh, for me, you mentioned Fump. Um, first of all, why why did why did Skip call its coworker Fump? Why did he call anyone anything? I guess, I guess. You know, it was yeah. I mean, I don't I don't know. To be honest with you, exactly why Fump? It's one of those things that's like, oh, Fump's out in the back chasing butterflies again. Fump. Um, I did, I think just he goes for the sound of it, right? He would go for the sound. I mean, I can remember being in the car with him and there'd be like this bulldog in a parking lot. Somebody's walking and he just looked at it and went, his name is Jum Jum. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, just like whatever it. he whatever came to him. It's, uh, it was totally an artistic <laughs> endeavor, I guess, for him. How do you both collaborate with each other to ensure the narration is staying true to the characters and the world of Eliorin. Who who goes first here? <laughs> I'll go first. That sounds like a deep question. I'll go first. Um I I think I said earlier um as I as we go chapter by chapter uh if there's a new character uh, I'll ask Wayne uh, what he has in mind, you know, how old is this, how old is this person? Um, as I read through it, is it, uh, is, is the person silly, funny, uh, serious, scary? Um, and where, where would you, where would you like this, this voice to go? Where would you like it to land? And I, and I always I always defer to the author because it's not my book. You know, it's your story and I want to bring all of the the honor to to your text, to your copy. Yeah. Um well, that's that sounds great. Uh I I um, you know, <laughs> I just try to support the process by by providing, you know, upfront information that I feel is going to be relevant for the most part you know, aside from like pronunciation guides um, and any notes that we've given about the characters, how I think they should sound or how they sounded to me or, um, you know, things like their age and mannerisms. I really just 
let Ed go with the story. Um, we we provide the script or you know the the actual text, and um, I I try not to give I try not to micromanage it beyond that. I I, I think it's good you know for him to naturally read it, um, and hopefully the story and the words will speak for themselves. Uh, what you know what is supposed to be there, and I think for the most part that is uh, that has been true. So. Um, I think that's pretty much that's that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, I'm obviously you know when we get the recordings, we're going through those and making sure that um, that it all you know the the mannerisms and inflections and all these things match up well with with what uh, with how it reads in my head, um, or even if even if it doesn't match exactly what I read in my head, that it works just as well. And um, it, and if there's an issue. We uh, ask Ed to correct it, and he's always great about doing that, but there's usually not a ton of issues, and um, I think it flows pretty well. So I think, uh, it's, I think that's pretty much it. I can't think of any other particular steps I've taken, um, but that's, uh, that's, think, that's pretty much it. I think there's I've been... Asked, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go on. I, no, I've, I've asked Wayne for um, a, a, a descriptive uh, laundry list in the past and actually he provided it with the without even asking for it of these characters and and what they're about and uh, and pronunciations and that that's always a wonderful guide and when i have all of these characters to to go back and forth especially from chapter to chapter if i haven't if this ch character hasn't shown up in four or five chapters i have to go back and listen to what i did the first time because i've now you know, it that was that was several days ago, and I create a a a a, a special track that's labeled with all of the names and a little clip of the voice, so that I know what's going okay. on. But yes, I actually wondered yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to send you a screenshot of that so people can see uh, what it is that I do. Yeah, we'll have it's, that up uh, on screen. That's very okay. yeah. That's very interesting because I I have wondered before um, how you keep track of the continuity um, of voices that are just kind of like little pop up voices here and there. Like if we don't see a certain secondary character, you know, we see him in chapter two and then not again until chapter ten. How how do you keep continuity in that voice? And we um, went through that with with uh, Murdoch's choice. Uh, if you recall, when we did the the second go around, the ensemble version, um, I had mixed up beep and thump for some reason. Oh, that's right. Because right. you know beep, you you would think a character named Thump would have a horrible lateral lisp with no teeth, right? <laughs> and and it was just the opposite. <laughs> and you said um, he sounds an awful lot like like beep or whatever it was right. and it's like you have to use your beep voice for him. Yep. you're absolutely right i'll i'll get back to you tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's yeah, yeah. But, i mean it's got to be easy to confuse that with so many characters and voices and that's you know when you've got a it's ship great it's of, great to keep track of that that you're organized <laughs> enough to keep track of that and i think mm -hmm. on the collaboration front i feel like uh, Murdoch's shadow has been written kind of with Ed in mind and the way that his voices play out for the characters and stuff. And as the lines were written and as we were kind of going through and revising them, uh, I know I at least was thinking, you know, can I, can I hear Ed saying this in my head? And, um, uh, and so, you know, that's an interesting point actually. Yeah. Because in <laughs> writing shadow, the, the, you know, we had already worked with Ed on choice and, um, and I already, you know, the characters have been brought to life in that additional way that transcended my original imagination. Um, so yes, it's true. I mean, Murdoch's shadow was written then with all of that in, in mind. And so now when I'm reading the character voices in my mind, as I'm writing it, I'm not even just hearing what I originally heard. I'm hearing Ed's voice doing it. <laughs> and, That's true. Uh, Wow. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, now, now it really Taylor fits. Yeah, and, and I better do this right. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure, yeah. <laughs> are, there, oh. are there any moments in the 
creation or narration of the Murdoch's Choice audiobook that stand, stand out as particularly memorable or funny. And I will go ahead and go first. What stands out to me was uh, doing the ensemble version uh, when we were reworking some of the sound effects and Wiggle Belly hitting someone with the pot came out as the Taco Bell bong sound. One of the Grimkins had grappled her from behind. A giant soup pot flew from the steps of the quarterdeck and into the head of the Grimkin holding Starlina. That did not go in the final product. <laughs> but no, for one not. take, it was the Taco Bell sound. <laughs> and it's funny because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't hear it as the Taco Bell sound. I just, I've, I, I searched my files for a, a bong, a pot bong, and that was what I put in. <laughs> and, and, and you, you said, uh, Ed, you, you made me want to order a gordita or something <laughs> like that. So, <laughs> but I'm we, we fixed now. it. Thanks, Ed. We, yes. It's like, hmm. Yes. I, I need some, I need some <laughs> refried beans, uh, this video is not sponsored, by the way. I heard, I heard that take and my bowels That's just went all quiver. <laughs> yeah, that was very funy. It's like, oh, that that's not going to work. Oh, but uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I think for me, um, it was in the scene in, uh, you know, it's the exciting it's the exciting chapter where the ship is um, is trying to get away from the dock before the whole thing burns down with eerie cold dark fire. And um, and Captain Murdoch hears us. This this is this ended up in the original audiobook, uh, the original version of it. Um, there was a scream from down below that could only be Wiggle Bell. And there's this girl, ah! just, yeah, it's a lady screaming. Clearly, a lady track. And um, honestly, I loved it because it was hilarious. And for some reason. I imagined the same thing happening. Zale heard a shriek from below that could only have come from Wigglebelly. Get those infernal fires off my ship! Um, but I think we, I think, I don't even know if we kept that later. Um, we did. But, uh, but that to me, st that, that to me um, stands out as one of the, one of the funny moments that we, that we've gone through. Did that? Did you say that didn't stay in the uh, the ensemble version? In in the final like revised first edition we have now, uh, that was. Do you remember Jacob? I don't uh, know if we, we kept that it. screen. We did. Okay, yeah, because I think I think, along with all the various changes we were making, we probably just decided it was, it wasn't going to come off the same for it, others as it yeah, was. Yeah, you you. For us. Yeah, Ed Ed recorded a uh, a, a clip of Wiggle Belly screaming. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we had to replace it with something more authentic. Yeah, so it's it's great. It ended up great, but the first one was just hilarious. Well, it, it's kind of funny. I have to go back and find and and look at the first one again because or listen to it because it's quite possible it was me sounding <laughs> like a little girl screaming. Well, that's even so. Better. I that's that that's even funnier. <laughs> Well, and but I'm not oh, sure. Man. You know, of course, for us right now, it's just the Zoom call that we're hearing. But as I'm as I'm editing the video, I'm going to be inserting these sounds. So yeah. Oh, please do. <laughs> oh yeah, we gotta please, get that clip. We gotta get that do. little clip on there. Yeah. You should show um, both versions then, how it ended up in the yeah. beginning, and uh, and then how yeah. it ended up in the current version. Zale heard a shriek from below that could only have come from Wigglebelly. <laughs> Get those infernal fires off my ship! It it could have been it could have been just a a, a standard uh, file of a scream, but I, I'm I'm not sure. But it could have been me, and that's that's even more embarrassing. Actually, I thought point. it was a standard <laughs> file of a scream because I think it was used in like two places. Okay, but, but yeah, okay, yeah, it seemed I, like I hope a you, track, I hope a scream track. <laughs> But if it was you, then um, I'm, I'm impressed. Impressed, yeah. yes. That's that would be my very estrogen-based side of my characters. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, you you asked what what was uh, what was funny or something I enjoyed memorable the most or, or funny, yeah. 
<clears throat> memorable. Actually, memorable was 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 coming up with the with uh, Murdoch's um, Zales song for the kids. Mm, Diplodor. Be, be, yeah, Diplodor. Uh, because I am a songwriter. Uh, you say that you're not a, a seaworthy type of individual. I live on the coast of Maine, and I have grown up with seafaring, maritime, and Irish kind of fiddly dee songs. So it was kind of fun to pull a tune out of my head, having listened to this my whole life. And uh, uh, mm. my my I uh, I ran it past my brothers. Uh, my uh, even, they're not sponsoring this video either, uh, but they've had they've had a folk group called Schooner Fair uh, for, uh, for for decades, and they have written songs that have been mistakenly thought of as a hundred years old, and they only wrote them back in the seventies and eighties. Uh, but I but I ran that past him. He goes, "Did you write that?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "God, that sounds like a really old song. That's really good." And I said, "Thank you." <laughs> <laughs> Diplodor the dinosaur He went down to the knick-knack store Got some snacks and a whole not more Diplodor the dinosaur yeah, but Dipl I We love, get a couple I of fun ones in Shadow too uh, there's, oh, good. A couple of, there's a couple of shanties in Shadow that, um, when I, that I wrote those Specifically listening to and researching And kind of mishmashing the elements of different uh actual sea shanties oh yeah yeah okay so do, do you have a melody with them or is it something you'd like me to come uh, up i with? do there's one that i've even that i even actually sang and recorded and had professionally finished like with music and stuff did you know um, i did i did and i can i, I did. think that will that might end up in our final ensemble cast version of murdoch's shadow down the line but um, uh, but I will send you that. And the other one, um, there is a there is a melody that I had in mind. Um, and I don't know. I'll either let you just interpret it and see what happens, or or I'll try to send you some kind of reference. But but you, you there there are there are a couple of good shanties uh, in Shadow that I think you'll you'll like. Oh great! I'm look. Uh, I yeah. am so excited to start this book. Yeah, Sam Dillard, yeah. who is a, uh, a really amazing musician. He's done a lot of video game adaptations, uh, Metroid Cinematica, Zelda Cinematica, Chrono Trigger, which is uh, where, of course, Wayne and I first connected. Uh, he did the Heroes of Time uh, overture uh, song for Murdoch's Choice, and uh, so we, uh, we had him also do the uh, Sea Shanty as well, so... Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. If the uh, if the Heroes of Time series were to be adapted into a film or TV series, who would you envision playing some of the key characters? And Wayne, I know you and I have talked about this for a long time, uh, but let's bring Ed into that too. Let me get my list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a list. Yeah, because well, part of it is because there are so many wonderful performers out there uh, who are the right age, and sadly, so many of them are no longer the right age. Right. Uh, but uh, let's see, who have I got here? Um, my first choice for Murdoch. You ready for this? Yeah. Sean, Sean Bean. Really? Hmm. Oh. What do you Sean think? Bean. But he but he lives. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> now <laughs> I I didn't do dead people. <laughs> no, I mean the character lives. Sean always plays people that die. <laughs> every every character, he? every character Sean Bean has ever played always dies. He dies in the Martian? I'm pretty sure he dies in everything. No. <laughs> No, he doesn't die in The Martian. I kind of forgot Sean Bean was in The Martian. He's he's just the good guy. He's the one. He just he defies um, Jeff Daniels. Okay. And and does it his way. Yeah, it's one of the few Very times he's, he plays right. a good guy. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I haven't um, seen it. Sean Bean. Very good. Okay. Now my second choice, and he would and he would 
My second choice for uh, Murdoch probably, and he'd hate this, that he's second choice, would be Jeff Bridges. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now, Cedred, you ready for this? Yeah. Brian Cox. Oh. Okay. Why not? That's interesting. He would talk yeah, about I think I mean I could definitely see that. Yeah, talk about leaning into it. He would have so much fun. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Uh let's see. Uh Vitamir Robert Downey Jr. Ooh. Wow. Wow. Man. That Ooh, would be interesting. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> So Vidimir was work. originally conceived as having kind of a voice a bit like Tom Hiddleston in Loki. And then we kind of later also added Thresh from League of Legends. And somewhere in between there is, is Vidimir. And, and then I kind of leaned, leaned towards Snape. Mm. From, oh, okay. From, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah he's, he's somewhere in there. Now, there is sure. a character in the first Ethereal that personally I always hear him talking like Snape whenever I read his lines. But yeah. Yeah. So Alan Rickman. The, yeah. Alan Rickman. Yeah. yeah. When, when you, when I read Vidimir, I, 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 I saw Alan Rickman in my head. And okay. It was more, it was more, <laughs> it was more diehard than anything. <laughs> I don't know why. I I'm just imagining Alan Rickman in his Snape voice saying, "Captain Murdoch, I'm pleased to see I finally garnered your attention." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I definitely can see that. Yeah, yeah. but he's dead. <laughs> what about you, Wayne? You got any? Um, so, I, so uh, Ed's Sea Dread really made it was really interesting because I I actually had Brian Cox in mind for Murdoch. Oh, <laughs> see, I, I, I. Okay, go ahead. But I just think he's too old for Murdoch. Uh, well, sure, he could be. Um, it is hard for me to think of somebody that really stands out as a good Murdoch, but. Um, yeah, he, he he maybe just the way he the the body size, the body type, the, the his mannerisms, the way mm -hmm. and I think of the way he looked a lot in um in Born Identity for some reason. Um yeah, Brian Cox came to mind for Murdoch. I would be very interested to see a Sean Bean performance though of Murdoch. Um oh man, I mean it's been a while since I've thought about it like this, but um um Tom Hiddleston for Vidimir is definitely somebody I tend to imagine a lot. Uh, for Starlina, um, I tend to imagine Kira Knightley. Um, I said Elle Fanning. Oh, yeah? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> did you Did you say did you, you didn't give a Starlina one, did you? No, I didn't. No, Elle, Elle, Elle Fanning was my choice. I mean, if if Emily Blunt were young enough, I would go with her, but she's not. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Uh, Kira Knightley is one that I had in mind, um, but uh, very fond of uh, Emma Watson, also possibly for that. And oh, I don't know. I have several Yvettes. Okay. Gal Gadot. Really. Um, yeah, Zoe Saldana comes to mind a lot for me in a bet. Yeah, but isn't she taller? Um, don't you don't you describe her as tall? Yeah, I don't know how tall Zoe Saldana is, but uh, I guess she's, she's super tall. She's she's kind of itty bitty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she yeah. Is, she. I, I I would say she is pretty tall in the book. Sure. Yeah. Um, another tall one, Layla Ali. Do you know who I'm talking about? Okay. Okay. Uh, give me something she was in. Oh gosh, I can't remember. But she's she's Muhammad Ali's daughter, and she's like oh, okay. five ten. Um, and I have I have a couple of extra pirates for you too, if if they wanted to have some fun for a couple of weeks. 
Uh, oh, Mark yeah. Ruffalo. All right. <laughs> All right. Is uh, Mark Ruffalo uh, Liam Neeson? What? Wait, know, who, who, a, who's uh, Mark Ruffalo playing? Oh, he can. Uh, I think he would be a really good beep. Real? Oh wow! Interesting. That's that's, okay. that's that's very fun to think about. Yeah. Okay. Um, Even doing the lisp and all, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it would be fun for him. I think it'd be a nice stretch for him. Uh, says says the director producer all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> And of course, you know, the, our, our favorite, you know, Ray Fiennes and Liam Neeson, you know, just just have them in there as surprises, you know, much like much like uh, a Pirates of the Caribbean. It's like, who is that in that makeup? You know, would be would be yeah. fun to would be fun to have. Um, and he has a certain set of skills. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys remember who William Peterson is? Um. I think so. If I saw the face, I'm he's a not character sure actor who's been around for ages, and uh, he's just one of those guys that you know you, you would just go, "Oh, of course he belongs on this ship." <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad they hired him. <laughs> but those are just those are just some of my names. That's fun. Very good. That's a good list. Good. Well yeah. done, sir. Well done. We'll make I sure you are consulted in the casting of this movie. Fine. <laughs> so for both of you, what advice would you give to aspiring authors and narrators wanting to enter this business or genre or any of that? Wing. Um, aspiring authors, you know, you're going to hear a lot of advice. Um, you're going to hear people giving you things left and right. You know, at the end of the day, people will say things like right to market, you know, right to be a professional. Um, and, and yes, being a professional is important, but at the end of the day, if you, you have to check why it is you want to be a writer in the first place. And is it, is it, is it to make money? Most of us, that's not really why we got into it. Is it because you have a story that you really want to tell and you feel passionate about and there's something you really want to do with that, sharing it to the world? That's a good reason. And stick with that. Um, and write what you know you're going to love. Um, and don't get too bogged down by the many different kinds of advice um, and uh, pointers that you're going to hear out there in the world because everybody's everybody's got a different flavor and everybody's got a different viewpoint. At the end of the day, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be you, and you've got to focus on writing that story that everybody absolutely has to hear because you know you've got to tell it. And um, and that's that's what I would say. Don't think too much about how you're going to sell it. Don't think about all the things that's going to bog you down later on the business side, just write the absolute best story that you can and start with that. And that's what's going to have to take off. That's going to have to be that spark. Um, and, uh, and then go for it and then, and then stick with it consistently because it's so easy to start and, and, uh, and for it to get difficult and, and you then just stop. There's nobody standing behind you. There's no boss saying hey you got to show up for work um and put in the time it's all on you and if that's a, if that story has got to be told then you have to stick with it right consistently uh, if not every day at least consistently and um and uh, until it's done and and then it's off to the races i would just add to that right the kind of story that you want to read what do you yes. got ed yeah, no, that I, I like that. Yeah, write write what you want to read. <laughs> That's the yeah, that makes sense. Um, as far as narrating, you have to think of fantasy voices like uh, like music or singing, and you have to you have to listen to all of it. I had the I had the fortune of growing up with lots of voices in my head, and not because I was nuts but because I was able to 
watch a lot of television, watch a lot of incredibly fascinating and, and talented people uh, and emulate them. I, I learned how to tell stories. You know, I was a boy scout, you know, I learned how to tell stories around the campfire, you know, you know, you learn how to tell a spooky story, you know, how to, you know, how to translate uh, folklore or, um, or, or tell a good joke, you know, it's, it's all in the acting and good acting and good, good interpretation of characters come through in an audio book more so than than in a, a film or on television because you don't have you don't have the luxury of a camera telling you where to look you have to lead your listener to where it to where you want them to go and as a narrator producer you get to direct all of it and you get to to create the pacing so as a narrator just just listen to others. Just go listen to a couple of others. Listen to the good ones, and then, and then just be honest. Every time you, every time you say something, just be honest about it. Listen to the good ones, like you. <laughs> yeah, <That's> right. <laughs> Thanks. 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 All right. Anything else you guys want to add? I think that wraps it up. I think so. Questions. Thank you, Ed, for being here. Really great hey, to this talk was to great. you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jacob, for hosting and for the questions. Absolutely. And, uh, thanks, man. Yeah. It was, it's it's I, been a pleasure uh, talking to you guys. I th and I'm <clears> looking <throat> forward to getting into Shadow, Murdoch's Shadow. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for watching. That's going to do it for us today. If you enjoyed this interview, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Heck, if you really enjoyed it, leave us a couple comments. It really does help the algorithm, and it lets us know what kind of content we should be focusing on. Don't forget to check out Murdoch's Choice and Murdoch's Shadow on the Heroes of Time store. And as thanks for watching this big honkin interview, use promo code HONKIN for 10% off your order. Single narrator audiobook for Murdoch's Choice is available in several formats, including digital download with an ensemble audiobook in production now. And, as we talked about in the interview, single narrator audiobook for Murdoch's Shadow is now also in production, and that is coming soon. Thanks again for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.